Hallelujah. I hope you praise the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you're ready to receive now the meat of this sermon on destroying the works of the devil. Hallelujah. We need to be destroying the works of the devil. Well, let's talk about this. First of all, Jesus should be destroying sin in your life and my life. We need to allow him to destroy the sin and the works of the devil in our life. That's the very first thing he came to do. Did you know that? But he, did you know Jesus is a destroyer? Think about this. Mark 1, 23 and 24 says this. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out. And this is the demon crying out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. The demon had confessed right there that Jesus could destroy him. Destroy them. Because he said us. Jesus can and will and does destroy the enemy's kingdom, does he not? He should be destroying sin in our lives, is my point here. Let's look at 1 John 3, 4 through 10. That's the primary scripture I'm going to refer to today in this teaching on the works of the devil and destroying them. It says this, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him, Jesus does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. That is Jesus. He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. That's verse 8. That's our key scripture. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. So, if we see here in verse Four, what does it say about sin? Sin, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. So lawlessness is living through your own ideas, superior to God's. You mean, meaning lawlessness says God may demand it, but I don't prefer it. Lawlessness says God may promise it, but I don't want it. Lawlessness replaces God's law with my contrary desires. In other words, I become a law to myself. Lawlessness is rebellion against the right of God to make laws and govern his creatures. Amen? You are a created being as am I. Who created us? God. If he wants to make laws, we have to abide by them. Who are we to say, we don't want to do it? That's rebellion. The work of Satan is to tempt us to reject the authority of God and become like God ourselves. That's what he did, right? That's what Satan did in heaven. He rejected it. He rejected the authority of God. He tried to become God himself. To, he wanted to elevate himself above God. Did he not? So Satan works to nurture and cultivate that pride in us. That's one of his strategies. Puts his, putting his own desires above the law of God in us through that pride. This is lawlessness. This is the essence of sin. And this is what the Son of God came to destroy in you and me. Are you getting that? We think of sin as, you know, just a simple thing of, you know, stealing something or disobeying your parents or, you know, fornication is sin, by the way. Um, you know, coveting stuff is sin. We, we think of the Ten Commandments as sin, but... Realize this, it all starts with what? Lawlessness and pride. Um, rebellion, you know. So, Jesus came to destroy these works. How does he destroy the works of the devil? Or sin in our life? Or lawlessness? How does he do that? Well, first, his life, crucifixion, resurrection is the first part of him destroying sin. Before him coming, before he came... We had no way out of our sin. You know, the Old Testament, they were making sacrifices all the time because of their sins. Who knows how many 
thousands of animals they slaughtered for their sins because that was the covenant that God gave, the Mosaic covenant, amen, to atone their sins or, you know, appease God because of their sinful ways. Well, Jesus came. We just celebrated his birth on Christmas. He came to destroy the works by going to a cross, committing no sin throughout his life. He was a sacrificial lamb, right? So he came to the cross to destroy sin in our lives, to remove the barrier between us and God. Amen? That's the first thing he did. And that's in verse 8, right? We see this in verse 8. By his appearing, it says, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil was, has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So the first thing, he manifested on earth as a child, grew up, went to the cross, committing no sin, was buried, died, resurrected three days later, rose again, right? That's the first thing he did. The second thing he did was this. No one born of God commits sin, it says in verse 9, right? That's what it says. Verse 9, whoever has been born of God does not sin. So what does that mean? Being born of God is being changed by God so that the dominion of sin is broken in you. In other words, are you born again? You know, a lot of people know and believe that Jesus Christ came and went to a cross and died, was buried three days, rose again, is seated at the right hand of the Father. But have they taken that second step? Are they born again? Being born of God is changed by God. That's the difference. Jesus said, no one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless they've been born again. Have you been born again? Do you know that Jesus Christ is Lord? That's one thing. I get that. You know, a lot of denominations, you know, make sure people understand. And people will say, you know, I confess Jesus is Lord, but are they born again? No one born of God commits sin, it says in verse 9. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. For his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. What does that mean? It means the spirit man in you cannot sin. You're a three-part being. Your flesh, soul, spirit. The spirit cannot sin once the Holy Spirit comes in you, once you're born again. And God is totally, Holy Spirit in you is totally renewing you. Making you more and more like Christ every day, or at least he should be, if you're yielding to him. If you're staying in the Word of God, if you're seeking Father, right? I mean, when I was born again, I didn't want to hear foul uh, music, foul language. You know, I still don't want to. I'll turn commercials on TV if I'm watching TV. Well, I, you know, I don't prefer to watch demonic shows, but if I'm, let's say I'm watching a nature show or a cooking show, um, just to relax and somebody comes on that's demonic, I'll turn the channel because I don't like the commercials. A lot of them are filled with. Things of the enemy, but anyway, that's one other topic. Which that's one thing is that's one of his works, by the way. Um, but the key here is this: sin is the work of the devil, as is lawlessness. And Jesus came and manifests Himself to destroy that by going to the cross. The second part is the person needs to be born again, right? That changes you, and that God then can reign in you. He wants to take dominion in you. That can only happen through the born-again process, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Jesus said this in Mark 2, 17, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. So unless you welcome Jesus into your life as a, as a destroyer of sin, you can't have him as a Savior. You need to allow him to destroy your sinful ways. You need to allow him to crush every thought and temptation of sin. That's why it says, have the mind of Christ. Amen? We need the mind of Christ, do we not? Take every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Amen? That's how he's able to destroy sin in our life. By yielding to him. Allowing him to destroy sin, even when it comes as a temptation. The, the enemy's cunning. The works of the devil are sometimes very, very subtle. Let's look at a few obvious things that we as Christians should be destroying on this earth for Jesus' glory. Amen. 
Amen. In other words, let's look at some more works of the devil. First of all, we already talked about sin and lawlessness. And, you know, I spoke about lawlessness. If if you don't like the things of God, that's lawlessness. And, and you go one step further, even the laws of the land, if you don't like them, well, you're under their authority. And I've already spoken about that in different topics. I've spoken on rebellion, is this witchcraft, and how you let witchcraft into your life, which that's another thing. Rebellion is, a, you know, a work of the devil. Is it not? We already talked about that, too. So if you go speeding down the highway, you're breaking man's law, but you're under that authority of the government, are you not? So you're in rebellion. Infirmities. Luke 13, 16. So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan is bound, think of it, for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? This was Jesus speaking to the Sadducees and Pharisees, if I remember correctly about the woman who was bowed over with an infirmity. She was bowed over. You know, you've seen a few people probably out in public before totally bent over. This was that woman. For 18 years she'd been like this. And Jesus said, whom Satan has bound. So Satan bound this woman and gave her an infirmity. You know, we can look at many, many, many scriptures, which I don't have time to go into all of them, about sickness and diseases that were caused by Satan, where Jesus delivered the person and the person was healed. Int instantaneously, by the way, they were healed because the demon was causing the infirmity, the sickness, the illness, the disease. Amen. He still does that today. That's one of his works. Disease, infirmities, murder and lying. John 8, 44, you are your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. This was Jesus speaking, by the way. He was a murderer from the beginning. And does not stand in the truth, liar, because there is no truth in him, liar. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for is a, he is a liar and the father of it. So if someone's lying to you, or if you lie, it's a work of the devil. Murder's pretty obvious. Who do you know that lies? They're not operating in the Holy Spirit. They're operating with the enemy. And that's one of his works. We need to crush them. So if it's a brother in the Lord or sister in the Lord, what do you do? You go to them with the scriptures. You talk to them in love. You correct them, right? What, what, how do we destroy the works of the devil if a person is bound for 18 years from an infirmity? You pray. You cast the devil out of them. Right? Jesus gave you the authority. Another work of the devil is he's also the ruler of this world right now. That's one of his works. 1 John 5:19. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Jesus even said in John 14, 30, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. He was talking about Satan, the enemy, right? He's ruling this world right now. However, get this, we have authority over him. Jesus put the Holy Spirit in us. He said, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you in Luke 10, 19. Hallelujah. Satan will hinder your plans. That's one of his works. That's one of his attempts. 1 Thessalonians 2, 18. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. He wants to hinder your divine intervention, right? He wants to hinder you doing the works of the gospel. That's one of his works, right? He can hinder divine intervention, as I just mentioned there, but let's look at this even more closely. How about being angels being sent on your behalf? He can hinder that from happening. Daniel 10, 13, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I had been left alone, and there were the kings of Persia. Excuse me. I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. So Daniel was left alone there, waiting, because the angel sent had to fight these demons in the Michael, had to be dispersed to fight these demons in the atmosphere. So he hindered divine intervention from getting to Daniel. He hindered angels, and the angel had to have call for backup. Michael had to come help, right? What else? What other works does the devil have going on that we should be destroying, church? 
Well, he can demonize people. He can deceive people. He can present counterfeit miracles. He can choke faith. There's all scriptural references to everything I've just stated, but I don't have time to go over all these today. I could do a whole teaching on each one of these individually. The biggest one I want to point out, though, was sin and lawlessness. John 10.10 10 says this, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be your name. So the church now, you and I, us, we're the church, have the responsibility to, to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Well, now we're here. He left us here. He left us to finish the job, to continue on, did he not? We are the body of Christ and must be about our Father's business, right? First of all, it starts with accepting Jesus Christ and being born again. First of all, you must believe that Jesus came for your sins. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've never had anybody speak to you, if you found this on YouTube, and you realize that I have sinned and I need a Savior, Jesus is the only way to the Father. He came and died on a cross for everyone's sin in this world who would accept him and believe that he died for them. If that's you today, say, Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. I believe that you died on that cross for me. And I am a sinful person, and I ask forgiveness for my sins right now. I need you, Jesus. And if that's you, great. Hallelujah. Now you need to be born again by being filled with the Holy Spirit. Ask for the Holy Spirit to come. Ask for Jesus to fill you. A lot of people believe that he came, but they're not born again. They haven't been renewed or regenerated by the Holy Spirit because they may be in a dead religion. What's that? That's a religion that preaches Christ, but puts no emphasis on the person being born again and changed and filled with the Holy Spirit. You need to be filled. Ask to be filled. Ask to be changed. Ask to be renewed. Father God, fill me. Renew me. I ask for your spirit. Put your seal on me, O Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Once you've done that, then it's time to crush the enemy. How do we do this? How do we destroy the works of the devil? By yielding to Jesus, first of all. By being born again. And then what? We use what the Lord gave us. Prayer. Preaching the gospel. Ministering the gospel. What's the difference between ministering and preaching? Preaching is with your tongue professing the gospel. Bringing people to Christ. By telling them the good news that Jesus Christ came for their sins, died on a cross for them, that they're separated from God right now and they need Jesus. He's the only way. That's preaching the gospel. What's ministering? That's doing the gospel. That's praying, laying on hands and somebody gets healed. That's casting devils out of people. That's raising the dead, right? That's commanding every virus, bacteria, yeast, fungus in a person to burn up and die that's not of the light in Jesus' name. That's crushing the works of the devil. That's destroying his works. Intercessory prayer destroys the works of the devil. Now, do you intercede? We're supposed to continually pray. Pray without ceasing. Do you fast and pray? Why do we fast? So we can draw closer to the Lord by crucifying our flesh. The flesh gets in the way. The flesh is at enmity with the Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us on how the Lord wants us to destroy the works of the devil. My people perish for lack of knowledge, it says in the Old Testament. There's so many Christians today who are bound by Satan as the woman was for 18 years. Daughter Abraham. There's so many bound by Satan still. They may know the Lord. They may have his spirit in them, but their flesh is bound up by the enemy. They have infirmities, diseases that we should be crushing. Amen? It's time for the church to rise up. It's time for the church to walk in the love of Jesus, obviously. But not only that, start crushing the kingdom of Satan on this earth. Showing the power of Jesus Christ over the enemy. He came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to abolish sin. So first of all, let's look at ourselves. Are you still sinning? Are you still lawless in some area of your life? Are you rebellious? 
You know, do you do everything right for the Lord except you like to drink on Friday night and you drink too much? Are you on a pharmaceutical drug for an infirmity that Jesus could heal? But yet, let, yet you have allowed the drug to take the place of Jesus in healing you? Now, don't get me wrong. Obviously, medications are needed at times. But there's many things out there that people rely on instead of going to the Lord with it. You know? That's a whole other topic. But anyway, so those are just some examples. You know, we should be crushing the works of the devil, destroying his works. That's what Jesus spoke to me this week. It starts with sin, accepting him as your Lord and Savior, being born again, removing all lawlessness out of your life, coming under the authority of God in all areas of your life, in your relationships with your spouse. Are you rebellious to your spouse? That's lawlessness. That's sin. In God's eyes, are you angry at times? Get upset with your kids? I mean, these are things for you to just question. You know, are you walking sinless? Are you walking under the law of God? What's the law? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Are you loving everybody? And so then it's time for you to start praying, start interceding, start binding devils, start casting demons out of people, start commanding healing on people, start anointing people so they're healed. As it talks about in James, call the elders of the church, anoint the sick and they will be healed. Right? Well, let's take communion. Hopefully this is a blessing to you. Hopefully you are ready to destroy the works of the devil. Hallelujah, because it needs to be done. Right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hallelujah. Well, grab your communion supplies. Let's bless them. Let's take of the Lord. Let's partake of him. He said to partake of him until he returns. We're supposed to take communion. Remember what he did for us at the cross. Amen. His crucifixion, what it's all about. So if you grab your bread, I'll bless it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in Jesus Christ's name, every piece of bread becomes a body of Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus Christ's name, every cup of water, wine, or juice becomes the blood of Jesus Christ now that they're holding in their hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. The Last Supper. He gathered in an upper room with his disciples, and he took some bread, and he broke it. And he said, take, eat. This is my body, given up for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So now partake of the body of Jesus and remember what he did for you. How he went to a horrible death of crucifixion for your sins and my sins and gave up his body. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. When the supper had ended, he took a cup and he said, This is the blood of the new and everlasting covenant shed for the sins of many. So through Jesus' blood and atoning sacrifice, he became the Lamb of God, slain for our sins. So take drink of the blood of Jesus, the new covenant. Let's praise and worship the Lord with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I'll be back after that with active prayer.